There we go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, we're, we're going to shift gears just for a moment, and I'm going to be focusing on a, a bit of a different topic, uh, perioperative stroke. And, you know, as we'll discuss, perioperative stroke, it, it might be a bigger problem than, than some of us perhaps realize. Uh, and unfortunately, there really aren't any easy solutions, uh, as we'll discuss. Um, some of our research group's uh, funding comes from the U.S. NIH, but otherwise I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So cerebral vascular disease, uh, major public health issue, uh, according to re fairly recent World Health Organization data, uh, second leading cause of death worldwide. Uh, in the U.S., where I practice, and I think many of us practice, it sort of alternates between the fourth and fifth leading cause of death, always a leading cause of disability, and costs the healthcare system billions of dollars each year. So what about the perioperative setting? You know, sort of an interesting study that was published two years ago. These are, are longitudinal data from the U.S. National Inpatient Sample. Uh, this was published two years ago in JAMA Cardiology. And the authors, uh, Smilowitz and colleagues, wanted to examine major cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events over years after non-cardiac uh, surgery. And if you look at this green line here, um, there we go. So if you look at the green line, that's incidence of perioperative MI, starting in 2004, and it's about 1,000 events per 100,000 cases. And, you know, it, it kind of stays stable over the years. It kind of decreases into the 700s here in 2013. Stroke, and that's the purple line, it's about half the incidence of MI back in 2004. And as you can see, I mean, it actually kind of keeps increasing to the point where the incidence in 2013 was about identical. You, you know, why this is, I don't know, but I, I will say, you know, worldwide, there's, there's a pretty robust multidisciplinary collaboration and, and guidelines around the management and prevention of perioperative adverse cardiovascular events. I, I don't know if it's equivalent for perioperative stroke uh, investigation and management, in part because it's, it's just very hard to study stroke, as we'll chat about. So the incidence, of course, varies widely depending on the type of surgery, major cardiovascular surgery, uh, fairly high incidence. General surgery here uh, appears to be pretty rare, 0.1 to 0.7 percent or so. But if you, if you really delve into the medical comorbidities, uh, the risk really increases. So in 2011, uh, George Mishur and colleagues at Michigan uh, actually created a, a risk uh, validation prediction model using U.S. NISQIP data. And they found that patients with five or more risk factors uh, actually had about a 2 percent risk of stroke. And these were things like age over 62, TI history, smoking history, COPD. Um, one year later, uh, Kamal and colleagues produced a similar study also using this quip data. And in their, their data set, five or more risk factors was associated with about a 3% risk of stroke. So not, not very rare. And then in 2016, uh, some very interesting data were published from the Neurovision uh, group, uh, international group aiming to study neurologic events perioperatively. Many of the investigators are from various Canadian uh, hospitals and universities. They recruited 100 patients worldwide, 65 and older, non-cardiac surgery patients. And they found that 10 of the 100 patients actually had signs of covert ischemic injury on post-operative MRI without any obvious uh, uh, physical exam findings. So kind of scary and, and startling to think about, but the point is both overt and, and covert stroke might be happening more, common, more commonly than we realize. So what about outcomes associated with perioperative stroke? So there's a really, really interesting study uh, Alexandra Saltman and colleagues published a few years ago in JAMA Neurology. Uh, these are prospective cohort data that came from the Ontario Stroke Registry, and they wanted to characterize outcomes associated with stroke in patients who were still hospitalized. So, so patients, medical or surgical patients who were in the hospital who experienced a stroke while in the hospital. Compared to the community setting, uh, inpatient stroke was associated with high mortality, delayed recognition, infrequent treatment, high rates of disability. And then if we look at surgical patients in particular, we'll, we'll sort of delve into this a bit, cardiac surgery patients, median time from symptom recognition to neuroimaging, about seven hours, non-cardiac surgery patients, 5.8 hours, uh, thrombolysis was, was pretty rare. Uh, death or disability at discharge, 75 percent in cardiac surgery patients, 84 percent in non-cardiac surgery patients, death or disability at discharge. And at one year, mortality kind of hovered around 30 percent in both groups. Um, we published a much smaller scale uh, institutional descriptive case series a year later from, from uh, the University of Michigan. But, but similar themes were present. Delayed recognition, particularly in patients who were, who were still admitted after surgery. Um, 
only 39% of our surgical patients who were hospitalized uh, were eventually discharged home. And those surgical patients who experienced a stroke while admitted had a mortality rate of about 36%. And, and to be clear, these are just descriptive, unadjusted data, but, but some of the themes are still consistent with, with the Saltman study. So that same year in 2016, uh, Sun and colleagues uh, wrote a narrative review in the, in the BJA uh, about clinical screening for stroke postoperatively. And, and two key points here, you know, detecting neurologic deficits uh, specific to a stroke postoperatively and distinguishing from distracting features like residual anesthetic or sedation, and that, that's really challenging to do, right, postoperatively, especially in the PACU where patients are, are still waking up. They're probably started on a PCA pretty quickly. Older, vulnerable patients might be delirious even outside of any sort of ischemic event. So I, I think this is a real challenge, and this is probably in part why we're often seeing a lot of delayed recognition for hospitalized patients. I think it's common to say, you know, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so is still asleep, groggy from surgery. It, I think to an extent many of us maybe are, are numb to it. I, I know I am. So I, I think clinical detection of deficits can be challenging for a lot of us in the perioperative setting. So with that in mind, about two years ago, we conducted a, a prospective observational study. It just came out this month in Frontiers in Neurology. And our, our objective was to test candidate strategies, object, object, objective strategies, for detecting cerebrovascular vulnerability and injury uh, postoperatively. And we tested uh, modified NIH stroke scale scores, intraoperative cerebral oximetry, serum biomarkers, and cognitive function trends. We recruited 50 patients, uh, 25 of which were, were high-risk patients who had already had a cerebrovascular disease history, and 25 matched controls based on age, uh, gender, surgical subtype. Um, and, and the first thing to show is just, you know, with all these patients who we performed a, an NIH stroke scale on, new positive changes were common. 20% uh, of patients in the control group, 32% in the high-risk group. So even conducting a postoperative NIH stroke scale, it, it might be useful in the right setting, but it's probably not very specific to stroke either in the immediate postoperative setting. So serum biomarkers, there, there's maybe some promise there, and a number of groups have examined serum biomarkers both perioperatively and in non-surgical settings. We examined four biomarkers um, in, in both the high-risk and low-risk groups. We examined S100 beta, GFAP, uh, neuron-specific enolase, and matrix metalloproteinase 9. And again, you know, in the setting of, of that neurovision uh, data set, you know, if, if 10 or so percent of patients are truly having subclinical cerebrovascular events, and, and some of our patients were high risk, the thought is maybe we'll see some sort of signal or some sort of biomarker increase in some of these high risk patients. Um, and, and I think two major takeaway points from these data. Number one, you know, the, the differences weren't there between groups, uh, but th there was a lot of variability. And if you look at this GFAP graph here, graph here it's a logarithmic scale, 0.01 to 10 nanograms per milliliter. Um, and eight of our patients had values that were above the upper uh, limit of the assay. So if any of these or other biomarkers are, are to be useful, I, I, these four, I don't know if they will be because there's just already so much variability that, that's inherent to the perioperative setting. So that's point number one is the variability. Point number two is this. We, we actually did have a patient who did have uh, some pretty, uh, pretty pronounced intraoperative cerebral vascular uh, ischemic injury. It was a control patient, ironically, uh, who enrolled in our study. She was 72, had a two-level thoracic fusion. The case went fairly well. And then at the end, she had uh, about a two, three-minute period of some pronounced hypotension with bleeding, treated quickly with fluids and pressors. And her, her cerebral oximetry values did decrease by about 20%, uh, came up within a minute. Um, didn't emerge from anesthesia and uh, was taken to the CT suite on her way up to the NICU. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not a neuroradiologist, but essentially the findings were, were bilateral cortical and subcortical um, areas consistent with ischemic injury, and that was corroborated by our neuroradiologist in the team. Um, and to be fair, there was no infarction, but, but just some areas where they thought there was some ischemic injury. And these were her biomarkers, these stars here, um, not robustly different from general postoperative averages. And she was attended for days. Her NH stroke scale was in the low mid-20s. Happy to report she's, she's home. She eventually was discharged home, ambulating with a cane, less I heard, and, and making a great recovery. But these four biomarkers didn't really help. We had a quick dip in oximetry um, within about a 20% dip from baseline, but we didn't see otherwise any robust strategies that really helped us to predict this event. Um, very briefly, you know, for the neurointensivists out there, you might recognize this image. Um, 
this is from an example subarachnoid hemorrhage patient who's starting to enter a vasospasm window. And the, the point here is in the right setting, um, neurophysiologic evaluation with EEG might actually be helpful. You know, this is a patient where we know they're sort of entering this ischemic vasospasm window and using advanced quantitative EEG measures, we can kind of see an increased ratio of slow wave activity. And, you know, perhaps there's, there's a role for advanced EEG measurements in the right sort of high-risk patients postoperatively. Um, th there are some groups that are starting to use advanced EEG measures for screening purposes in the outpatient setting, and, and maybe some of this could be adapted to the postoperative setting. We'll see. Um, so to wrap up, I'm going to touch on a brief uh, physiologic and pharmacologic prevention strategies. Um, our group at Michigan and many others have uh, studied perioperative beta blockade in relation to stroke. And the, the physiologic framework here, you know, if we go back to our, our old uh, thick equation, in the setting of beta blockade and hypotension and hemorrhage, cardiac output goes down, oxygen delivery goes down. And then in the setting of nonspecific beta blockade in particular, uh, with more beta 2 antagonistic activity that we often see with metoprolol, cerebrovascular vasodilatation may also be impaired. So in the setting of, of beta blockade, bleeding, hypotension, you know, we don't necessarily just see reduced cardiac output, but impaired cerebrovascular dilatation, and there are laboratory models to support that and, and clinical data to support that. So this graph is, is from a retrospective cohort study, um, Ashes and colleagues from the University of, of Toronto Healthcare System. Um, these are unadjusted spline models, but, but descriptively, we see, and these are from 44,000 non-cardiac surgery patients, as hemoglobin goes down, you know, stroke risk goes up, and it's highest from a topral law where risk uh, approaches 1%. They did perform uh, propensity match analyses afterwards, and, and bisoprolol was still associated with a significantly lower risk of stroke. And, and I guess to me, physiologically, the takeaway here is that patients who are presenting for major surgery where a lot of bleeding is expected um, might need a higher transfusion threshold and more rigorous hemodynamic management uh, in the OR. Um, the scheduling of surgery might actually also have a role in prevention. This was a very interesting study from a group in Denmark published in 2014. They used a Danish nationwide cohort sample uh, over, I think it was 100, 480,000 cases. And unsurprisingly, you know, they found that, that patients with a prior stroke history had an increased risk for a new postoperative stroke, uh, perhaps not surprising. But within three to six months, if, if the new surgery happened within three to six months of a prior stroke, the odds of a new stroke were really high. The uh, odds ratio here, 67 within three months, 24 within three to six months. And you know, it, the, the risk didn't level out until about nine months or so. So for, for what this means for your individual patient, who knows, but I think that the general theme is that if somebody's already had a recent cerebrovascular event, it, it might be worth delaying purely elective surgery for a while, maybe months before, before bringing them in. And I think physiologically that, that tends to make sense to me. Um, aspirin. Aspirin. Aspirin's, I think for many of us, always very challenging. So these are very focused data from the POIS-2 trial, and I think this could be its own separate talk. POIS-2, I'm sure many of you know, this was a large multi-center clinical trial. About 5,000 patients were randomized, at least in this sub-study, to placebo versus aspirin. Again, non-cardiac surgery patients with at least one risk factor for major cardiovascular events. In the overall trial population, uh, and again, stroke was, it was a secondary outcome. It wasn't the, the primary outcome of the study by itself. Aspirin or placebo across the entire population, there wasn't a difference in stroke risk. Same with the continuation stratum. So that is patients who were already on aspirin, and then if they were randomized to keep taking aspirin versus going to placebo, no difference in stroke risk. Somewhat oddly, you know, patients, many of whom were kind of low risk, who were started on aspirin versus started on placebo in a randomized way, Big reduction in, in stroke risk in those who were started on aspirin, sort of de novo. The authors cautioned this might be a spurious finding. There were a few events. This was one of 19 different secondary outcomes. And the effect size here, the hazard ratio of 0.25, it's a much greater effect size than, than what's often seen in the outpatient stroke setting with aspirin. So I, I think there's still some more questions about who should be on aspirin perioperatively, and many of the patients that make up these strata were still fairly low risk, so I, I think there's still a lot of questions that persist here. Uh, so just to wrap up, in terms of bridging, bridging is always a topic, too, that can be challenging. So these are some distilled recommendations from some of the major medical and surgical uh, societies. I, I've sort of, for me, distilled it down to two main themes. Number one, for low-risk patients, so lower CHAT2 scores, no cerebrovascular disease history, 
the recommendations are pretty consistently to avoid bridging. For high-risk patients, so higher CHAD2 scores, five, six, seven, particularly with cerebrovascular disease history, the recommendations kind of gravitate towards uh, at least considering bridging, if not outright recommending it, especially with, with high, again, high CHAD2 scores and known cerebrovascular disease history. Um, I, I think it's worth pointing out, you know, the, the observational studies and trials that inform these guidelines, they, they pretty consistently show an increased risk of perioperative bleeding and hemorrhage with, with uh, bridging. So I, I think the key is trying to identify those really high-risk patients who, who need to be aggressively bridged, and I think that's something as a field we're also trying to wrestle with. Um, but again, the, the highest-risk patients probably should be bridged, but if they're not particularly high-risk, the risk of bleeding will probably outweigh any possible benefit of reducing a thromboembolic event. Um, so to include perioperative stroke, probably an underappreciated incidence, poor outcomes, physical exam findings, and as of today at least, serum biomarkers probably aren't very validated or reliable. Um, candidate prevention strategies for patients who are beta blocked, specifically metoprolol, and, and, you'll, and you've probably all seen this in the ER too, they, they just might need a higher transfusion threshold and more vigilance with hemodynamic monitoring. Um, there is, I think, consideration towards delaying elective cases if somebody's had a recent stroke to try to prevent experiencing a new postoperative stroke. And for aspirin and bridging, I, I don't have a great answer for you. I think it's a lot of the recommendations are still taking high-risk patients on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and even the POIS2 trial, I, you know, I think less than 5% had a prior PCI, 5% or so actually had a stroke history. So those who are really high risk, I think we're still trying to understand how to bridge them. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Happy to take any uh, questions at the end. Thanks.